Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Felicia Walker from the National Student Attendance Engagement and Success Center. Welcome to today's webinar, Engaging and Learning Through Student Voice. Before we begin, I would like to share some brief details about today's webinar. Today's webinar will last for approximately 60 minutes with time for questions. We will be placing everyone on mute. Please do not unmute yourself, but instead refer to the chat function on the right side of the screen if you have a question. Please feel free to log your question as the presenters are talking, and we will leave some time at the end to answer those questions. If we do not have enough time to get through all of the questions, we will reply to all participants by email within the next five to seven days. We encourage you to ask questions or simply share a comment. Today's webinar is one of a number being offered by the National Student Attendance Engagement and Success Center during 2017. This is a new technical assistance center funded by the Department of Education's Office of Safe and Healthy Students. The mission of the center is to disseminate evidence-based practices and build and facilitate communities of practice to help students attend every day, be engaged in school, and succeed academically so that they graduate high school prepared for college, career, and civic life. The two communities of practice referred to in the center's mission are focused on the 30 National My Brother Keepers Success Mentor Sites and the many SIG and SIG eligible schools throughout the country that are working to implement early warning system programs to address chronic absenteeism. Although we have run into several unanticipated delays in launching the TA Center website, we are pleased to announce that we recently took a significant step forward in this process and we hope that our site will be live very soon. Today's webinar is being presented by Donette Hall. She is a facilitator from Johns Hopkins University School of Education and currently working in Tulsa. Oklahoma with three elementary schools, three middle schools, and two high schools on using early warning systems and social emotional learning to improve student outcomes. She is also part of the early warning system national team offering support across the nation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Okay, Donette, I'm passing things over to you. Great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Let me get the slide to advance, and there we go. So today we are going to learn about student voice and the importance of student voice. So after today, you will be able to define and understand the importance of student voice, and you will also gain knowledge of how to capture student voice, and this includes a process called student ambassadors. So the first thing we need to do is define student voice. So it's hard to have um, something if we don't understand what it is, so we really want to know what it is. Student voice gives students input into their school and their classroom. It encourages students to take ownership of their educational journey with guiding parameters. So it gives the students um, the ability to have input into curriculum design, developing policy. So if you think of classwork, you can think of interest inventories. Um, they can choose book choices with different genres. They can help it design different experiments. Um, so for instance, they can look at helium. How does helium compare to oxygen? Okay, if you blow up a balloon with helium, what happens compared to when you blow it up with oxygen? And they can design different experiments to help them understand those concepts. They can also create lesson plans to share knowledge. For instance, they could be a teacher for the day. They could create games to teach a specific concept. They could do different things to help enhance the curriculum. 
And policy is a huge thing. They might have influence on how long passing periods are. Maybe they recognize that a five minute passing period um, causes a lot of people to go off track and maybe get into trouble. So they might suggest that it go down to like three minutes depending on the size of the school. Or they might need more time to go somewhere, so maybe you need to increase the time. So it's great that they have input into those policies. We also want to know, uh, we also want to make sure it increases student achievement. Okay, we want students to have a sense of connectedness and we want it to improve the behavior. We want it to increase the student investment. For example, a group of students um, in one of the schools that I work with noticed that lots of the students were very unorganized. They couldn't find their homework. They lost things in their locker, you know, they all had locker monsters that ate everything that they put in there so they could never find them to be able to turn them in. So this group that I was working with decided they wanted to help the other students. So they decided to write a skit and they practiced it and they actually recorded it and they were able to show it to other students. So it taught them how to organize their lockers and their binders so that they were able to find things when the teacher needed them. And it was great that they were able to share it with the whole school. We wanted to increase student motivation. So in some of the schools I've worked with, students were asking students to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. So an example of this is one school I was in decided to do a uniform fashion show because they had a huge problem with students not wanting to wear uniforms, not wearing them correctly, um, and just, you know, in general not doing what they were asked to do as far as uniforms were concerned. So this group of students, and of course we selected the ones who had the biggest problems with wearing their uniforms, and we got them to show how they could accessorize their uniform, you know, like maybe a certain bracelet or a certain necklace or, you know, a really cute pair of socks. So they really got into that and they were able to uh, motivate not only themselves but other students. So that was a lot of fun to do. So just to recap really brief. We want to make sure that students own what their, what their school is doing and they are able to help the school succeed. Um, student voice builds student confidence. It normalizes sharing. It gives multiple opportunities to share experiences and opinions and ideas. And it allows everyone's voice to be heard. So I want to know how you have used student voice. Okay, so over in the chat box, if you go into the chat box, type in so that everyone can see it, because right now it's probably defaulted to just the host, but if you go in and it, you mark it so everyone is selected, then everyone will be able to see what you type in. So just give a few examples of how you use student voice in your school. And maybe you haven't thought about it. Maybe you don't utilize it yet. Okay. And I'll give you just a little bit here to be able to go ahead and enter those. Anybody have any good ideas of how you're using student voice already in your school? Okay. We'll continue to monitor that and see if anyone adds anything. So we want to make sure that we are engaging students in developing initiatives. This is very important. Um, students have the best idea about what motivates them, what distracts them, what frustrates them, and they talk to their peers and they also get input from them. In one of the elementary schools I support, students had poor attendance. The teachers actually began having conversations with the students and asked them, what would it take to get you to come to school every day? You know, what? What incentives could we do? What's preventing you from coming? You know, let's get to the root of the problem. Do you need an alarm clock? So through that conversation, they were able to better support the students and help those students be there every day. Transparency about falling off track is common among students and staff. 
Okay. Having common expect expectations that are known throughout the school by all stakeholders, using common language, both of these will increase transparency and help you know when your goals are met. So some schools that I know of have created posters to indicate what grades actually mean. What does an A mean? What does a B mean? What's it mean when you get a D? So when have you actually mastered the skill? And so they hung those posters up. And so everybody in the school was aware of the expectations and how to meet them. Other schools have students that keep data binders to track their own attendance, behavior, and course performance skill mastery. And these give the students a clear picture, again, of the expectations and what it looks like to meet each one of those. So I see over in the chat box, thank you, Kathleen, for sharing. Students are on bullying prevention steering committees to create broadcasts to whole campus. That's a great way to capture student voice, and they feel such a huge part of the school in that way. So in capturing student voice, we have some questions that you can ask yourself as you begin to think about it for your school. So what are some effective ways to engage students in planning initiatives? Okay, do you want to ask a specific group? Do you want to ask a whole school? You need to make those decisions. How will you capture student voice when planning incentives, activities, and events? Okay, so that's another good question that you need to ask. What incentives are you planning? What incentives would the students support? What activities would they help support? Do you want to have an attend dance, and it, which means if they have good attendance, they get to go to a dance at the end of the day? So what type of events are you wanting to hold? And really get student input on those. And then how can we inform students about the importance of staying on track all year? Do you want to do an advertising campaign? Do you want to do announcements? How do you want to capture that? So to go a little bit deeper into these questions, here are some starter ideas for capturing student voice. Okay. Do we want to use a student survey? Do we want to give a survey to a focus group? Do we want to give it to just a particular grade level? Do we want it just ninth grade? You know, are we really focusing on the transition? And if so, how are we going to help support those students? By asking the students and talking to the students, you are building greater um, buy-in. Um, do you want to vote during lunch or as they walk in the door on different initiatives that you want to implement? So as students walk into the cafeteria, maybe they, you know, if you want, if you want it to be a fundraiser, they can drop a penny in whatever jar they think would be the most um, useful to them. I've also seen posters created where they just took a sticky, you know, a little sticky, and they stuck it under whatever answer they wanted or they could add their own, and it was very effective. Um, you could also have someone, you know, you'd have a group of students taking a poll of other students. What would you be willing to work for? What would not work for you? What would get you here every day? What would help improve your behavior? Having peers ask peers, ask, having them actually hold conversations and talk to each other and determine what would be the best way. Um, other ways, like you can have a student nomination or selection committee for planning committees, and that goes back to what Kathleen said about the bullying prevention steering committee. That's a great way to, to incorporate them into the school. Um, the student groups, another way is in a classroom if you have an opening circle. You know, you could ask that question of the circle, and they could share their opinions and their voice would be heard. Informal conversations. Okay, sit down, talk to the student. <clears throat> um, it can be one-on-one, -on -one, it can be two-on-one. -on -one. Maybe the principal or assistant principal comes in and holds a conversation with the student. Maybe it's during an advisory or a homeroom or a time period where you can do that. If you're in English class, maybe you have them write about what different things would influence them and help them want to change their behavior, basically, if they want them to improve attendance. So there are also two ways of looking at this. So I want to go more into what student organizations and student ambassadors are. So student organizations are usually open to a select few people. 
Um, usually, like if it's an honor society, they have to have like a 3.8 grade point average or higher. So it really limits who you can have. Or if it's student council, some student councils, you have to be elected into it. So again, it limits to who can be there. They often have a specific pur purpose, so it kind of limits the work that can be done. They don't have much voice into what they are supposed to be doing. So it makes it harder for them to, to implement their own ideas. It also includes um, program initiatives. If you look at student ambassadors, they are open to a wider range of students. There is less restrict, restrictive criteria. The, you have to facilitate the efforts of the school. You, um, gain insight into student thinking. So if the students want to talk about things that interest them, maybe they want to talk about anti-bullying or cleaning up the school or different things like that, they're able to do that. Um, gaining a student perspective on culture and climate. Okay, Do they feel safe? Are there issues that adults might not be aware of? Is there some type of cyberbullying happening that hasn't reached the ears of the administration or a teacher or a caring adult that would help those students through that? Um, building those positive relationships through the student ambassadors is one of the key components for it. Um, oftentimes, too, when we're looking at students for that, we're able to put them on a probation period. So say they don't have the best attendance, we can work with them on that and they can still be a part of it, but it's probationary and they understand if they don't make a change in their attendance or in their behavior or if they're failing classes, they need to make a change to be able to raise their GPA. And we're able to work with them better on that, usually in student ambassadors, than you are in student organizations. So with student ambassadors, there are there is a student process, and it begins with an application. So on the application, we want to share why do we need you. We want the students to know what they're getting into when they sign up for this. So do they want their voice to be heard? Do they want to help make decisions about the school? Um, do they want to be a positive role model for other people? Do they think they've got what it takes? And if so, we want them to apply to become a student ambassador. And these are just some things that student ambassadors do. We want them to be a leader. We want them to give school tours. So when you have visitors that come in or prospective students or different people, you're able to show them around. We've had students give tours to the superintendent. We've had, um, we had people from Brazil that came and visited us. They were able to give those school tours, and it was great. The people loved hearing it from the student perspective. We want them to be a true represent, representative of the students. Um, we want them to share their ideas to help our school. We want to make sure they're able to communicate not only with each other, but with the school as a whole. And we want to make sure they're willing and able to help others. So those are just a few of the character traits we, we look for. And if they don't feel like they have those, we can help them develop those and make them feel confident in themselves. So this is what we put on the actual student ambassador application. We need their name and, of course, their ID number or some identifier. <clears throat> and then we want to know why they want to become a student ambassador. Why do they think they have what it takes? We also want teacher recommendations so they can find what teachers they relate to and have a positive relationship with, and they can get teacher recommendations from those teachers. Um, and basically, all the teacher puts is, I think this student would be an excellent student ambassador because, and then they go ahead and tell why. We also want to make sure that the family or the parents know about this and that they're involved. So we do ask for a parent or guardian signature. Sometimes those meetings will be held before school or at different times, and we want to make sure that those parents are supportive and able to get their students there. And then, of course, we want the students to sign it. <clears throat> so there are certain requirements, although they're not as restrictive as organizations. So we want at least a, a threshold of attendance. We want them to have attended so many times, and you can set that based on what you require at your school. 
We do want people with no suspensions, but we also understand that people might have had a suspension, but they're working really hard to change. And so we will kind of look at that and determine if they would be a good fit for student ambassadors. And we do ask uh, for course performance that they have a C or better. But again, we have probationary periods that we will help support students and get them into tutoring and get them into different things that they need to raise their grades. The meetings, um, you need to determine when they're going to be, you know, how often they're going to be and what time they're going to be. When can the majority of students get there? That's the, that's the best place to start, again, getting student voice to determine when the meetings are. Focus areas that we usually focus on are attendance, behavior, and course performance. And we focus on these because these are the key areas that indicate dropouts. Another big area that we focus on is the culture of the school. They are there every day, and we want to help them help the school improve the culture. We also want to know what goals they want to accomplish. Okay, and the adult can guide those, but we don't want them to be directive and say, this is what you have to accomplish. The students really, truly need to come up with them on their own. So now we have a voice from the field. I'd like to introduce Lori Takawira, who has been a school transformation facilitator with Johns Hopkins University Talent Development Secondary for three years. She facilitates a student ambassador group at Clinton Middle School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thank you, Lori, for joining us. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Donette. Uh, so I'm just going to share a little bit of my experience with student ambassadors at um, Clinton Middle School, which I've had the privilege of um, facilitating for, uh, for the last couple of years since I came in um, a little bit halfway through the year, but um, during my first year. So one of the things that Donette mentioned was that there are requirements, but they're not as limiting as some other organizations. And the requirements are the attendance, behavior, and course performance. Students are required to have a C or above, um, and they're required not to have any suspensions. So I wanted to tell a little story about how there's flexibility with that. And um, Donette already mentioned that we work with students on those areas because our goal is obviously to help them be successful in those areas. And so I had a student who actually um, last year, she ended up uh, getting suspended like, I don't know, maybe a month after she became a student ambassador. And so I spoke to her. Um, we had a conversation in my office and she told me, she explained the situation to me. And I told her, I said, you know, to be a student ambassador, we're representing the school. Um, and one of the requirements is that you can't have any suspensions. And she said, I know, but this isn't something that's, you know, a norm for me, and I don't usually do that. Um, so I want to commit to you that I'm not going to get suspended, you know, anymore this year. And I said, okay, I said, well, let's just start out, you know, kind of small. And how, how about we don't get any referrals for the next week, and then we'll grow from there. And so she and I created a contract together um, that she signed for probationary um, time period and she didn't she didn't get any more referrals and she had no suspensions the rest of the year and she actually um, ended up doing really well so that was that's an example of that the course performance part um, for uh, C's or a, or above a lot of times you can leverage the student ambassador program to help encourage students you know, to continue um, doing better in their classes, like if they're sliding and they're, they have a D, um, to encourage them to get their grades up so that they can continue to participate. And it may be that rather than coming to a student ambassador meeting one week, they go to that teacher um, during that meeting time and they work with that teacher on their assignments to get their grade up or the skills or the things that they need to do. Um, the other thing that uh, that we do, that I did, and all that I did was facilitate the conversation. As Donette mentioned, I just asked questions um, to get them to really come up with their goals, what they wanted to see accomplished for the quarter, the semester, um, the year, and so my responsibility was really just to facilitate that. And then also, we did this last year. 
we allowed for um, a president and a vice president so that the, the students could actually start leading those conversations and then I was just there as needed to help facilitate. So that was a really neat thing that we did this last year to help build that, um, that, that those student leaders. Um, we established team agreements. The very first meeting that we have, we always establish the team agreements. What are we going to agree on? How do we need to work as a student ambassador team um, to make to make this year be successful and to implement the ideas and the things that we want to. And so the students come up with that. We review those during every single meeting. So every single meeting opens up with an opening circle question, a restorative um, circle question and getting to know you. So someone might be, you know, since it's the holiday season, um, what's, your fav what's your favorite holiday memory or what's a family tradition if you have any um, during the holidays? And then we would move into reviewing the, the team agreements and then we get into the agenda. There was always an agenda provided um, for the meeting so that it kept us on target because our time was very limited. I had a lot of challenges last year with um, finding the time to do the meeting. So we met before school started, um, which also created other challenges for students who rode late buses or you know didn't come to school by the time that we met but those that could would come um, and then some of the some of the activities that we did um, we did a we last year and the year before we did a poster contest um, to support the school-wide initiative so last year our assistant principal was promoting keep Clinton clean and so I presented it to the student ambassadors and I said you know, our, our assistant principal wants us to support this initiative on keeping Clinton clean. So what would you like to do to support that? And so they all said, well, let's do a poster contest. And so I said, okay, what kind of poster contest? What is that going to entail? What are the parameters? And so forth. So they helped create a rubric for the, um, for the poster contest. And they said, well, not only should we keep Clinton clean, like, physically with the trash and everything, but in word and, and deed is what we call it. So keep Clinton clean in word and deed. So the words of our mouths should be clean as well. And so they came up with that. And then we had a um, ice cream party for the advisory groups that won from each grade level. Um, and then we had another one where they wanted to do something on bullying prevention. And we were talking about the needs of the school for the student body. And they said, well, we don't just have issues with bullying in the school. We actually have issues with um, keeping a positive attitude. Um, so maybe we should add positive attitude. And then another student said, well, not just a positive attitude, but sometimes people aren't, they're not necessarily bullying, but they just say really nasty words, um, like swear words all the time. And so it's also, you know, speaking positively and being encouraging. And so I said, okay, so I'm hearing a bunch of different things. So what do you want to title this, this poster contest? And so one of the students came up with a road to a better life because they said, as we make wise choices, <clears throat> that it's going to help us have a better life. So we did that um, poster contest. We involved the teachers um, in the school as a part of that uh, to, you know, implement it. And it was very successful. And then another thing that the students felt that we needed to do is they said, you know, we really don't, there's really not a team spirit for whatever reason um, in the school, and we'd really like to do some team building activities. And so I said, okay, if we did team building activities, what would that look like? Um, and when would we do that? And so then we brainstormed some things, and obviously I take everything that the student ambassadors, you know, share goes back to the administrator. Um, through me just to make sure that we have permission to, you know, move forward with it and our planning and collaborating. Um, and so they said, well, what about that one with the hula hoop is what they said. So there's a picture I think that Donette has to um, share. And we did the, um, I'm sorry, I'm going out of order, but um, th so we did the hula hoop activity where the students have, um, they're in a circle and the hula hoops put around them and they have to keep their hands, you know, holding their hands. Yeah. And, and get it through the circle. And the team, so we did that with the students and the student ambassadors led everything. They gave the instructions on how to do it. 
um, answered questions from the students. I was just there as a facilitator on the side, you know, to help if, if I was needed. And the teams that got it through the quickest won a candy bar. So that was some incentive, but that was something that we did. And what we always do is we always have a plan B or a backup plan for anything, <clears throat> excuse me, for anything that we would do. So I said, okay, this activity we're planning for outside, what's an inside activity that we could do? Should it rain or snow or, you know, the weather not be so they said um, they said they wanted to do the straw tower activity. So that was the other um, team building activity that we had planned for that day. And they helped me put together all the bags with the resources and everything. We never did have to use that because we got to do the hula hoop activity. Um, the other thing that they helped with is a teacher appreciation, which if you go back, one, sorry, um, is the gratitude part that Dunn had posted before. And on this, <coughs> And for this specific uh, thing, we they created posters. So you see the poster there. We love our Clinton Warrior teachers and staff. Um, but we made several posters, and we posted them all over the school and in the um, workroom and in the main meeting room where a lot of our teachers met. And then the students on their advisory, so it was different students during different um, times, we took this card around and all of the teachers, we went to every individual teacher and staff member, it wasn't just teachers, it was the staff members, and we they just shouted out, you know, we appreciate you, thank you so much for all that you do, and they got to pick a bag of chips, a candy, um, either a candy bar or Starburst or whatever was there, and a soda, and it was huge for these teachers. I mean, they were so excited to, they're like, we get to pick one of each. That's awesome. You know, so they, it was really cool to see that. And then also just to see um, the teachers come and hug the students and just that interaction. So that was really, that was a really fun and cool thing that we did last year. Um, and then also <clears throat> something that we did through the student that came about from the collaboration on teacher appreciation is we had all of the students, every single student in the school wrote a personal note to a teacher. And how we did that because we were racking our brains around, okay, how do we really do this? It's time consuming. How do we get every teacher to get something or staff, teacher and staff? So we always included all the other staff members, paraprofessionals, the attendance clerk, the counselors, the security, everybody was included. Um, so we ran it through the uh, lunch time and we had a list of all the staff members. So the students could choose from the list of the staff members, but once one staff member received two notes, we crossed that staff member out. And so we were able to have personal notes from students written to every staff member, and then we placed them in their mailbox. And um, so that was something that we had done through student ambassadors as well. And then they also helped when we had luncheons, like we had um, teacher appreciation, staff appreciation lunches. They asked if they could help serve, and so they came and helped serve those meals, and that was really that was really cool. And uh, the teachers enjoyed seeing the students there to do that. Um, as Donette mentioned earlier, tours we gave tours to schools and colleges um, that came to visit. That was a really unique um, opportunity for our students because after they gave the tour to the college students that came, um, the lady who was in charge of that actually bought everybody pizza and the students, our students were able to talk with the college students about college and what happens after school. So that was a really neat opportunity for them. And then some of the other things that we did is just post-it notes on lockers, encouraging post-it notes on lockers. So from what it really helps with the student ambassador program is very helpful for building that positive um, school climate and culture, not just among the students, but with the um, adults in the school as well. And so that's pretty much in a nutshell. We do a lot of stuff, but that was some of the things that we've done and have been successful. Okay. I have a few questions for you. So in working with student ambassadors and really listening to the student voice, what have been some of your biggest challenges with implementing that? So I would say one of my biggest challenges was really the, t to t the time to meet, number one, with the students. Because one year, the time was 
allotted in the schedule because the lunch has just worked out really well to do it during lunch time to meet with all of them. Since it is since it is sixth through eighth grade that I was working with, all sixth, seventh, and eighth grade could meet at one time during lunch time. Last year it was very challenging because they all had different lunches and could not meet at one time. Um, the way that our schedule was was challenging for time even for teachers to collaborate, let alone students to be able to collaborate. So we had to really think outside the box and um, I received permission from the principal to have meetings before school. And so most of the meetings were on Tuesdays or Thursdays before school for those students who were able to make it at the time that we started. Those who, did, who were unable to make it, most of them would come to me and tell me and say, hey, you know, Miss T, I'm not going to be there tomorrow or I'll be late. Or they came and saw me afterwards and they say, oh, my bus was late. Um, can you fill me in on what happened during the meeting? I even had one student, which I was very impressed. She took my business card and I didn't even know she took my business card from my office. And she actually emailed me about the meeting and said, I'm not going to be there tomorrow. I have a shadowing at another school. So, I mean, they were very responsible most of them to let me know if they couldn't attend um, the meetings and then I just fill them in. So I would say time and scheduling and we had to be very creative um, with with that time. And then some of them, I would have them come on their lunch even though they weren't all together and they would help with creating the posters or they would come up with the quotes that we were going to put on the posters. And so we would collaborate separately um, during that time. So that was probably the most the most challenging was the time to find. Um, how did empowering students to have a voice impact the students? So I, so I believe that it empowered them by um, helping them feel like they were heard, number one. Um, two, I think it created a safe place for them. They were very, I mean, because I was able to build that relationship with them. Um, <clears throat> And through the restorative questions that we had at the beginning and the end, some were really personal and they could choose to pass if they don't, if they didn't want to share. But I think that um, it created that safe space and it allowed them to build their confidence um, in sharing and just stepping out and taking healthy risks. Because I think that some of them that came in at the beginning were very shy. And then by the time that the year ended, I mean, they were getting up in front of their peers and presenting things when normally they wouldn't do that. So I think it built a confidence in them. It built that student leadership piece. Um, and the, and obviously the example that I gave earlier, the other thing that, that's empowering is it did connect them to college with that college tour that came. Um, so I'd say, yeah, feeling heard, it was a safe space confidence in connecting them to college. Could you share with us one of your greatest successes or a most memorable moment? Yes, I could. <laughs> <laughs> Put you on the <laughs> um, I think the greatest success for me personally, and then I'll share a most memorable moment, would be the building relationships with the students. Um, because even I went on I went on maternity leave at the beginning of this year, so I just retired. I've just been back about a month. And the, fir the first day I stepped foot in the school, I had about five of the student ambassadors from last year run up to me, say, Miss T, Miss T, where have you been? Oh my, you know, and we're, and so it was really cool um, to have that welcome back and to see them um, because I'm not, a, you know, I'm not in the classroom every day. So it keeps me connected to them. So I think the relationship piece is probably the biggest success. And I ha I'll give you two examples of memorable moments. So at Clinton, we are big on the restorative conversations um, at, to restore the relationships of the, of the students to the teachers when, when, you know, perceived harm happens in the classroom. So if a student gets sent out of the, of the classroom, then what happens is that teachers to have a restorative conversation with that student about what happened um, and how each person felt to restore the relationship back so that when that student goes back in the classroom, they are successful and continue to be successful. So one day I had one of our, um, one of our student ambassadors came to me and was talking to me about a really, uh, like she was really upset with this teacher and she was just going on and on and on, you know, and I said, you know, we, 
we shouldn't be talking about teachers like that. And I said, you know, could it be that he misunderstood you or you misunderstood him? And it's just a communication breakdown. And she said, well, yeah, I guess that could be the issue. And without me asking, I mean, I just asked her a couple of questions. She said to me, she says, well, I think I need to have a restorative conversation with him. And I said, well, that might be a good idea. And she said to me, she says, well, can you go with me? And I said, I can go with you, but you're the one that's going to be doing all the talking. I don't mind going with you. That's fine. And so that was a huge thing for that student because she is a, she was a student who had some, you know, attitude issues. But for her to be able to come to me and talk to me about that and then take that step was a was a huge thing. And then another memorable moment um, that I had is last year, Donette mentioned that we had visitors from Brazil here. And um, they came to see the school and some other things that we have been implementing. And so we had our student ambassadors share with them um, some of the things, you know, that happened at the school and their perspective. And they, they asked questions of the students. And one of the girls, too, she's very, she's very um, soft-spoken, kind of keeps to herself, not completely withdrawn, but um, not really talkative or outgoing. She kind of lingered after that session of the um of the ladies asking her questions and she said i forget how the conversation opened up but she started talking about some of the stuff that went on at home and how she was concerned about things and in the end what it what it ended up being is a huge breakthrough for her because she was so stressed about everything she just started crying um, and not that we want our students to cry, but it was like a release, like a, a cry that's a release and relief for her. And I was able to connect her um, with the counselor. So once again, going back to that relationship piece, because they've, they've spent time, um, you know, I've spent time building relationships with them in the meetings and, and, and working on um, helping the climate and culture of the school not just on the student level, but also on the adult level, she felt comfortable enough in front of strangers to open up about some of the things that she was concerned about. So um, that to me was a memorable moment. And we had another, so I'm going to one more and then I'll be done. Um, there was one student who I, who I had mentioned, she was extremely shy. She uh, volunteered for the talent show and she went out on the stage when her song started and you could tell she was visibly, um, you know, nervous, shaking, and just not wanting to do it, and then walked off um, because she was so, yeah, because she was so, you know, nervous. And so, of course, the people who are facilitating the talent show continued with the talent show, sent the next person up. Well, there were students that went and encouraged her and said, hey, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. So she went back on the stage and she held her hand over her eyes the entire time she sang that song, but she sang that song and not one student made fun of her that whole time. She, and so that was a pretty awesome thing to see because I do believe that not just the student ambassadors, because obviously there's so many things that touch the students at the school, but I think that being a part of student ambassadors, helping with the tours, you know, presenting and doing things with the students did help to build her confidence. Um, and so that was a that was a memorable moment as well. It sounds like student voice has really had a positive impact on the school. Absolutely. Um, so at this time, thank you, Lori, very much. Mm -hmm. And this time we're going to open up the webinar to questions from you. Um, what questions do you have for us around student voice and getting students engaged? And if you just want to, <laughs> if you just want to type them into the chat box again, please send them to everyone so we can see them. We'll be happy to answer questions. Student voice can be very powerful. <laughs> Go ahead, Felicia. Donna, one question that uh, I have is, do students apply each year and can the same students continue to apply? Yes, students can apply each year. We do ask that they refill out the application. It's more like dedicating themselves to doing that again, you know, instead of just being a shoe in We want to make sure that it still has their interest and it's still something they want to do. Um, so we've had several, uh, so this started actually with some students in sixth grade, and so I've seen them move all the way up through, and now they're in high school.
Okay, thank you. And the next question was, would you recommend, what would you recommend as a first step to implementing student voice? Finding a way to connect to those kids. It might be an interest survey. Just You kind of need to know what you want their voice in. Do you want to input on curriculum? Do you want input on policy? So kind of determine where you want to start with student voice and then go ahead and come up with how you're going to do that. You know, are you going to have someone talk to them directly? Are you going to do it um, during a circle in the classroom? Are you going to talk to them one-on-one? -on -one? So just kind of take that first step. Teachers can also do it very easily when they're thinking about what, what they want to teach. They can talk to the students, you know, how do you want to learn this? Do you want to... Um, do a hands-on experiment? Do you want to go visit a, a factory or someplace, you know, that they would be implementing whatever you're learning about? Um, giving them that input. That's the best place to start. Yeah. And I agree with on that, on everything that she said, I think, and she just talked to the piece about giving them choice is actually giving them a voice. And so if you, the more you implement choices for them, um, you know, on what they on, on what they prefer, or what they'd like, you know, to have implemented into the lesson, um, or what they want to, you know, study, if, as long as it's within the standards that are being taught. I mean, that's also giving them a voice. And, and most likely, students who feel that they are heard and have that choice um, are, you know, take ownership of what they're doing. So it's, you know, it's a, qu it's a quick way to get buy-in as well from the students. One way I saw a teacher start that is they had basically a bingo game of opportunities. So they had, you know, like five across and four down and you had to create bingo, but each square had an activity. And so the students got to, yeah. got to choose what they wanted to do based on the parameters. And then they were able to implement that. Okay, Donna, you have a question from Alina in the chat box. Right. So any advice on balancing student engagement with policy, school climate, and pulling students from class? We need them to be in class, but also need them to be engaged in these ambassador programs. So the, the very first year we did this, we actually held meetings during lunchtime. They'd go and get their lunch and come in. So we did not pull them from um, any particular class. And then I think after that, pulling in from academics is always a concern. Uh, yeah, most schools will say, absolutely no, you can't pull them during that time. So you, you get very creative. Pull them during lunch. Pull, uh, if they have an advisory or homeroom, see if you can make that your advisory or homeroom. You know, have those kids in there. Um, meetings before school, after school, or, you know, whenever you can truly find the time. It, does, it takes being very creative with time, but I would encourage doing it at a time that's not during, a, especially a core area class. Right. I don't want to take them away from their electives either, but most elective teachers, if you talk to them and it's not every single day, and it's like every other week if you did two, you know, if you're, if you're going to start it out, maybe you start with two meetings a month, um, and then you grow it from there. Uh, like I said, last year we had no, not, we had no same lunches, so we had to uh, be creative, and we did meet before school, and then I just met with sixth grade separately, seventh grade separately, eighth grade separately, and they helped with their portion of whatever we were, you know, implementing um, during, that, during that time, so. And another concern was if you stay before or after, they don't have transportation. Right. Yeah. So you always run into that, too. Um, so quite honestly, lunchtime has been the prime time to pull them and work with them. And as far as time, I know it says um, need them to be engaged in these ambassador activities. So like the tours that happened were during the school day. And we just, I just communicated with the administrators and, I, you know, I asked for permission and the teachers, yeah, administrators and teachers and asked for permission to have the student ambassadors come. Now, if they had, you know, assignments or projects, there were times when teachers said, hey, you know, I prefer for, you know, Johnny to be in class, and I said, that's perfectly fine, no problem with that. And then I just explained to the student, hey, you know, you're doing this project, it's very important that you're in science class today, and that you're a part of that, you can be a part of the next tour. And so it was, um, 
you know, just communicating when you do have activities or things that you want to do during the school day that require them to be out of class, um, you know, for their for their core area subjects or even their electives. You always want to communicate with teachers and administrators, but and get that permission, but just to make sure that they're making up their work. And then I would send an email out of all the student ambassadors that would be, you know, participating in the tour in the times. And then I would always put in there, it has been explained to the student that they are responsible to make up all work. And then during our next meeting, I would follow up with those students and I would say, okay, did you get your assignment into your English teacher? And I, you know, and when I see them in, in school, I would just ask them to hold them accountable. If that didn't quite get to what you wanted it to, please just feel free to ask, get, ask, you know, and we'll expand on it. So if you have other questions as you think about it and kind of digest everything that's been shared, um, I put my email address up there. Please feel free to contact me. Um, I'm usually really good about answering email. Give me 24, occasionally 48 hours, and I'll get back to you. <laughs> so please feel free. Any advice, any help you need, anything we can do to support you, let us know. Uh, thank you very much, Lori and Donette, for sharing your information with us today on Student Voice. And thank you to the participants for participating. We hope you found it helpful and informative. A reminder that this webinar recording will be emailed to you within seven to 10 days, and all webinar recordings are available as the address that you see in the chat box. So you will receive this actual recording of the webinar in seven to 10 days. And please keep an eye out for emails about our website, which will be live very soon. And thank you so much for your attention today, and I hope that you have a great remainder of your week.